I am a huge fan of like, if it's not broke, do not fix it. Welcome to The Art of Gardening. I'm your host, Melissa Lalo Johnson, and I am very excited to have my dear friend, Kelly Lehman, back with us today. Thanks for being hey, nice here. Nice to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Well, Kelly, I wanted to talk to you because it is time now. It's time to get outside and start cleaning up and start pruning. So I kind of just wanted to see where you were with your cleanup and what we should be doing for especially our hydrangea care. Yeah. Um, I love how we like jump right in because we were saying before, like when, when Melissa and I, like we say, when we watch a, or we listen to a podcast, like you love to jump right into those tips and that's what we want to do right now. So we're talking spring cleanup uh, for like hydrangea care. So some care for your hydrangeas this spring. So one of the most um, common questions that I get from my flower tribe on YouTube and Instagram and our Facebook flower tribe group is, you know, I see my neighbors out there pruning. Um, should I get out there and, you know, cut my hydrangeas down at this time of year? So, you know, we're, right now we're like towards like the end of February, March, and um, it's really important to go out there and try to figure out what type of hydrangea that you have first. Because if you go out there and you prune back, say like a mop head hydrangea, an endless summer, a Nico, and if you wind up cutting that down, say like, you know, to two feet, basically you just cut off all of this year's blooms. So a lot of hydrangeas have blooms that come in on what's known as old wood. So those blooms were put in place last like uh, uh, last August, you know, like around fall. And so if you go in there and, and cut them back, you know, you're going to miss out on all those blooms. Um, and it's a different story if you have hydrangeas like your smooth hydrangeas, like your Annabelle's, like your Incredibles, uh, or other hydrangeas like your limelight hydrangeas, because those hydrangeas come in on what's known as new growth. And so those blooms are going to start coming in towards like the end of spring, you know, even early summer, they start coming from more of like the base of the plant. So you don't have to worry so much about pruning. But if you don't know what type of hydrangea that you have, my best advice is to leave them alone. And I have to tell you, we um, have a flower farm in uh, Cranberry, New Jersey, and I've got like hundreds and hundreds of hydrangeas. And I literally will prune back maybe like, I don't know, like 10% of them. So if you just leave them alone, you're still going to get beautiful, beautiful blooms uh, for, you know, hopefully, hopefully that, you know, if they were blooming last year beautifully and, um, you know, someone else, a, a couple other people had said, well, what if I don't deadhead off all the blooms from last year? Like what happens then? Like, will the new flower not come in because the old one's still sitting there? And um, I am like the world's laziest flower farmer. So to get out there and deadhead everything at the end of the season that, you know, we didn't sell would take me like like weeks, I leave those blooms in place. It's not the best gardening practice because if you can deadhead just the blooms, you know, we're not talking pruning. If you could just deadhead those blooms, it's better for the plant uh, for like a lot of reasons. But if you just can't get out there and you can't get out there and deadhead those blooms off from last year, you still will get you know, other blooms that will come in, they're just going to be maybe like a little bit smaller and they might be like a little crowded. You might have some moisture issues, um, but don't panic. Like if you can't get out there, you didn't deadhead them. It's okay. If you can get out there and just kind of deadhead them, like just deadhead like that old spent flower off, like right above a set of fresh green leaves, uh, that's your best bet. So- so I have That's a really kind of large one in the back that mm -hmm. I have always, cause I'm like super OCD about all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I like a crazy fool make the rounds on my property. I mean, I don't have nearly as many oh, as you good. have, but yeah. I go through, thank you. And I go through and I clip all of them, okay. but this one's making me nuts because it's starting yeah. to get huge and I don't want to make it smaller, but it's okay. massive. So what, so can I take like a pole trimmer and like kind of just round it out or yeah. what, what kind of hydrogen is it? Uh, it's, a of, it's a limelight. It's a limelight. It's probably now about no 12, or, 12 or 13. Limelight literally, are, like the, I, if, if you're new to the hydrangea game, limelight hydrangea is the way to go because I get more bang for the buck with this plant than anything else, I think, on the whole flower farm. So yes, you can definitely go in there and clean up your hydrangeas. And that goes for limelight, Annabelle, and even the mop heads. So if you have, say, like, you know, it's spilling out over onto like the sidewalk, or like you said, it just looks really crummy in the bed. It's taking over any of these, including the, the mop heads. You can go in there and I call it the, the, the spring cleanup. You can trim around it, but just know that if there were any blooms that were put in place on the mop heads, 
you're just not going to have them, but it's going to look better shaped. It sounds like, like in your garden with your mm-hmm. line, you know, the same thing with the limelight. If, if you need to like, you know, make it smaller then you know, give it that trimming, but know that it, that new growth is going to, a lot of times it's not going to stay that size. It will, you know, fluff out again. Yeah. Well, but in the thing, meantime, I want it to get big. I want it to be huge, Yeah. but I don't want to have all the dead on it right. in spring. So that's where I'm kind mm-hmm. of like, should I just maybe use like a, you know, a pole saw or something and keep it pretty big, but just go up and, you know, or a, a yeah. trimmer or, and just kind of trim it up. I have ones now and I'm going to actually, you know, send some footage. I've got some limelight hydrangeas in the flower farm. I think they're literally like 20 something feet tall. I saw and yours I, last year. I remember and you, I'm, you couldn't and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to send them over. So, you know, if you guys, I think you can also, we're going to let you also watch this on YouTube. So we'll let you know, I guess, in links below where to watch it. Perfect. But this, these hydrangeas are like 20 feet tall. And I literally might've pruned them over the past 20 years, like four times. So I let them go. And a lot of people are like, you know, if you prune them back, then you get more growth. And you do. I mean, that is that is a thing. But know that with limelights, they just like, you can't keep these babies down. Like they just want to keep getting bigger and bigger. So um, yeah. And you know, another thing with the pruning, and this is like, you know, just like something to always keep in mind, always keep in mind the three Ds. So you can always at any time of year, cut out anything that's dead, diseased, or kind of damaged. So if you see like, you know, you know, like sometimes the sticks of the hydrangea are like cracked, you can always cut that off. If you see like a disease on it or there's some crazy stuff, cut it out. And if it's damaged, you know, it's kind of like bent or, you you know, it's going to be growing kind of wonky or it's two of the branches are, you know, rubbing up against each other. You can always cut those branches out because it's just going to be more work for the hydrangea to support those dead damaged, you know, or diseased branches. So any time of year, you can cut those back. So let me ask you a question because I've seen some people. So for instance, I want, especially in my front yard, my limelights to be very full and be very thick and pretty. And so when I'm looking around and, you know, I kind of just trim mine down because I've always wanted them to grow as much. I've kind of just taken the, you know, just deadheaded them and let them be. But then I do Mm -hmm. notice that a lot of branches will, are, they're dead. You know what I mean? Like they, they they haven't come back. Always cut the dead ones out. So are we supposed to be going all the way through and cleaning up all the little tiny branches or is that Mm -hmm. something that really doesn't matter? Yeah. I mean, if, if you can get in there, I call them like the little scragglers. If you can get rid of the scragglers, that would be great. Um, here's what happens on my flower farm. So with my limelight hydrangeas, if I know, like, I might know that I have a wedding or something that I'm doing flowers for where I want like those massive, like 12 to 18 inch colossal heads, that hydrangea, I will prune back by about a third. And I'll do that around, you know, like, like the end of winter is a good time to do that. So I'll look at the plant, I'll cut it down by like a third, knowing that when it comes back, they're going to be colossal. However, if you're talking like you're landscaping, here's the story with that. You might not want those giant colossal blooms like on the front of your house because sometimes it also makes the branches a little bit heavy. You know, sometimes, I mean, it doesn't flop over like sometimes the Annabelle will, but still it's, it's a different look. But if you want smaller blooms that kind of come in all around, then leave it alone. So if you do prune it back, do it by about a third kind of sounds like what you want. And you know what the best thing is? If you have like two limelight hydrangeas, do the exact opposite with them. So like one of them prune back, one of them don't. And then the next, then that like that season, you'll see which look you like better. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, they're both beautiful, but if you want those yeah. colossal, like, you know, like when your neighbors walk by, they're like, oh my God, like, what are you doing in this thing? Then, you know, prune it back by about a third. Okay. So then maybe in the, front, right? it's on the front and I don't want them drooping and I don't want to do the big heads that are going to get full of water when it rains. In well, the summer. That's another thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. So then yeah. maybe I'll keep those. Okay, cool. I'll definitely have to yeah. you know try that and put some, because I mean, every year I prune them every year I've done it, but I also don't get a lot of good sun up there, but that's why I love yeah. the hydrangea or the um, limelight in particular. Cause I don't, you know, the sun on my property is it's very treed and very heavily treed. So yeah. Um, but I still get blooms on them. I still get probably like 10 or 15 blooms per plant then they're yeah. under trees. I love, I love this hydrangea. I really, it's funny because my mother-in-law, we just did, we called it like a fake podcast yesterday. I'm going to wind up posting it on my YouTube, which, cause it was really funny. Cause she's like very, um, let's just say she's very, um, there's no filter. 
So we're like goofing off on the couch and she's like, you know, my hydrangeas, I can't stand them. And she's like, they never bloom. They're horrible. And I'm like, stop harassing your hydrangeas. They're only two years old. And a lot of times it takes a hydrangea like two or three years to bloom. And she's like, I'm done. I'm ripping them out of my crown and I'm throwing, I'm bringing them over to your house. And I'm like, stop harassing them. Sometimes it takes two or three years for them to give you those beautiful blooms. Well, let me tell you something. I've had two Nico blues. They don't okay. get a ton of sunlight, but they do mm. get some and yep. they have never bloomed. And I got them in 2016. And at first, mm -hmm. this is before I knew I was cutting them down every year. Um, right. So now I know, don't do that. Idea. But I mean, mm -hmm. I've left the, I've left them be for, I'm, this is now going to be the third year that I've left them totally be. And mm -hmm. what, is there any advice for those to get them to bloom? Well, First of all, I'm in the same boat as you. I've got, I think, 20 different varieties of hydrangeas on the flower farm. The only thing that will not bloom or does not bloom well are my Nikos. However, 12 years ago, they were packed. And someone in my neighborhood, my girlfriend, Susan Mavoid, is actually, they had like a, a historical house tour. She actually used like, I don't know, 400 of the blooms to decorate the entire town's houses. And then like two or three years later, nothing. So some people say that if you don't get blooms after a while and you know, cause it could be a fertilizer issue. Like if you have high nitrogen in the soil and a lot of times people will, well, you, you're great with the lawn, like you're the lawn expert. So lawns are, you know, the fertilizers are high in nitrogen. And a lot of times if you have, you know, you've just fertilized your lawn, that high nitrogen you know, fertilizer will run off into the, the garden bed and nitrogen's terrific for those big leafy lush green leaves, but at the expense of the blooms. So you might, you know, you might want to do a soil test and you might say, Hey, you know what? I just have to tweak the nitrogen in the soil. Or like you said, it might be a sun issue. You know, like, like they need like at least six to eight hours of sunlight, you know, yeah. that, that would be amazing. And sometimes it's a watering issue. Uh, but I've, I've tried them all. I've tried the overwatering, underwatering, check the nitrogen, check the sunlight. And I still have a hard time, which is why I stick more to like some of the, uh, the, the newer varieties because the Nikos were kind of like our grandmother's go-to, mm -hmm. but, um, I'll do more of like the proven winners, mop heads that are coming out now that are, they come on in on both like the old wood and the new growth. So you get yeah, two different flushes of flowers or like the endless summer. You know, mm -hmm. you get like a big flush of flowers in the beginning of summer, and then you get like another flush on this. So you have old wood hydrangeas coming in, and then you also have new growth. And so that's, that's just another option, you know, when you're out there. So um, I love the point of bringing up the soil test, because that's actually something I was going to start talking to, um, you know, making reels about and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are really unfamiliar with soil testing and like where to get it done. And here in Missouri, what we do is we, uh, through the extension office, Yep. You can go to your local extension office. They actually hear the, the tool is free. So it looks like a, like a T yep. crossbar and it's got a, um, you know, a plugger at the bottom. So you just kind of dig it down into the soil, give it a twist, pull it up, and then use something like a screwdriver to push the soil out. Um, I always let people know too, to do different, like if you're going to do the front yard, the West, the North, you know, whatever, and like kind of do the different areas, like take five to six different plugs so from smart. a small area in each of those sections and pay for a separate soil test. Yes. Like here, they're like 15 bucks a soil test. So mm -hmm. when you're adding up multiple different areas, it's definitely, you know, a thing, but it can right. add up, but it's so worth it to know. So, it's so especially it, for yeah. people with the lawn, because now we're getting ready to start fertilizing. We're getting ready to do all these things. Um, and typically you should do this in the fall for the lawn so that you know if you need lime. Um, oh, some of our numbers- right. yep. Yep. have been really low. So then we had to put lime on the lawn for, we did that for a good six years. I mean, every winter oh, wow. lime went down and then we have a lot of trees too. So the acorns and the nuts go in the ground and that makes, yep. that turns your soil acidic. Oh, absolutely. So you have to like be careful, which is why I thought the Nikos would love the spot they're in because they're underneath trees. There's all kinds of- I know. I can't figure it out. I don't know. If there's any Wait. gardeners out there that have figured out the Nico, please yes, let us know. Please leave it in the comments because that would be ideal. Honest, anyway, yeah, we would love you. Yeah. So for the yeah. soil testing, you know, cause a lot of people have no idea what to do or how to do it. And it is really easy. It's a very easy process. You know, you sign that little tool out and then just bring it back and pay. Um, but, and then, you know, the results come back to you, they send it back to the university. So ours is university of Missouri, Mizzou. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll send it to, to the university and then the, the students and the professors that are doing the turf grass areas and the um, biological testing and stuff like that. They'll put, they'll check all of those 
um, you know, they'll check and then you get a really nice report. You get a really nice report, a thorough report back about everything that's uh, in the lawn and what's not in the lawn. And then you know how to treat for the upcoming season. So when we started doing that and we were able to actually really look at what our lawn was missing, Mm-hmm. It made a huge difference. Oh, wow. Oh, that's great. Here. I know in New Jersey, Rutgers University does it. So I think that I used to have a link. I think I might still have a link. I'll, and I'll, I'll try to link it. You know, I'll send it to you. We'll, we'll try to link that below. Um, yeah, definitely. And it's just a link that says put in your zip code. And then you can find out the local extensions that are in your state. And then hopefully that's still a thing because it used to be a thing like two or three years ago. And yeah. then bam, it just gave you, you know, and same thing. You have to pay, you know, 15 or whatever the, the price was, $20 but so worth it. And most of the time you don't have to do it every year. Like I know that your lawn, it was a good idea that you did it because you had to keep tweaking it. Mm-hmm. Most of the time gardeners won't have to do this like every single year. Sure. You'll do it when your flowers aren't blooming or you'll do it yeah. when you're having an issue. I am a huge fan of like, if it's not broke, do not fix it. So if you have beautiful blooms and everything, don't, don't even do a soil test. Yeah, you know, for like sure. if you don't Something's need to right. anything, yeah. stay away from the fertilizers. Cause a lot of times gardeners just over fertilize, they over prune, they over fertilize. Like I said, I only grow flowers like peonies and hydrangeas and sunflowers that thrive on neglect. Like the more I leave them alone, the more flowers that I get. So that's kind of like the rule of thumb by me, by my neck of the woods. Well, and that's a great point because, you know, I learned that the hard way when I was start, first started gardening, you know, the big box stores and places like that kind of like subconsciously train you that you need to have all this stuff. Yeah. And so I started putting everything down on the lawn and then, Mm -hmm. you know, then, like I said, the, um, gardeners, you know, or the, not the gardeners, the, uh, lawn guys that come around do the pre-emergent and things like that. He was like, Hey, you know, I can put stuff in your beds. You won't have any bugs, this and that. I was like, that sounds amazing. So then they started treating my beds and then I had the thrip outbreak and the thrips just like ravaged my property. And so what my friend Kurt Wilkinson taught me was that with using the synthetic fertilizers, I was using the 10, 10, 10s, the granulars, the 12, 12, 12, yep. and I was putting that everywhere. And so yep. the plants were uptake, specifically the hydrangea, were uptaking these, the ammonias and the ammonia turns to sugar. And so yep. the, the thrips and the aphids and all those sucking insects, that's exactly what they're after. Wow. is looking for that. No so it totally disrupts, you know, again, like you were saying, it makes the beautiful blue, or beautiful green leaves and it makes it look like it's a healthy plant, yeah. but it's you're stressing the plant so hard. And then it's making it completely open. And on top of that, when these insects are sucking that that sure. out of the, yeah. you're feeding them these fertilizers that actually are like a hyper stimulant for them. Oh, God. It actually is like a superfood. So it became this really bad thing. And he said to me, just stop with the fertilizers. So now this is going to be going into my third year of no fertilizer, except for the worm teas and the natural stuff. So the way that that works, what, what he has explained to me is that you know, those things have perfect uptake by the plant and it's a mm-hmm. slow release. Yep. It's not anything yep. that's going to bam, bam, bam. The plant can't oh, handle it. Then it turns yeah. to sugar. So it's all very slow released. It's all organic. It's all, all of those things. So then there's nothing there for the sucking insects to really want. So your plant yep. is now unattractive to them. Meanwhile, your plant is also getting a stronger root system and doing more development underground. So you have a healthier plant all around. So it's yeah. changed everything here. I was oh, fighting I with this for years mm-hmm. and now just even in two seasons of backing off the fertilizer. And then also the other thing I learned with thrips too, because I had them all over my hydrangea. Uh-huh. If you get them. And again, I was having more of a trouble with it because I had killed off all of the beneficial insects because they were coming and spraying like every seven days. Cause I was losing my mind with these thrips. Right. So they were coming and killing all the beneficials. The beneficials were not eating the thrips. The thrips were going crazy off the plants. And like, it was like this terrible thing. Yep. So now, um, if I do see something that, um, I trim the, the, I, I trim the, the branch oh, out I immediately yep. before I was like, I don't want to trim my hydrangea. I would rather oh, just no. spray it. So then I was yeah. tr- spraying and spraying where now I just trim that out and it has yep. made a huge difference. Oh, huge. that's huge. And you know, I'm glad you brought up the whole idea too of like, um, like with that worm tea, like now is like a great time of year to do the compost. So people mm-hmm. are like, well, you know, I fertilized already. It's like, no, composting is very different than fertilizing. So I totally agree with you. If, you know, your plants are looking good, hold off on the fertilizers, you know, unless they really need it, you did your soil test, but now was like the best time of year to add some compost, you know, and, and like not, listen guys, 
don't do three to five inches of compost because then you can also, you know, like, I don't know, do some nasty stuff to the plant. Maybe like an inch or two of like an organic compost because what you're doing with the composting is you're feeding the soil and you're making the soil happy and you're you're releasing all these nutrients in the soil you're um you know encouraging those worms to come and the worm tea is is going to help even more and what those worms do is they kind of aerate the soil and now you know so now like all the vitamins the nutrients are loosened up everything's nice and airy and like now your hydrangea is waking up to like this really nice environment instead of like this you know, like harsh over fertilizing when it's first coming out. So mm -hmm. um, in spring, like, you know, right now, end of winter, early spring is a great time to apply some of that organic compost. And then if you want, you can even put like a little bit of uh, like the mulch on top. And once again, don't overdo it. Like people do like the mulch mountains and it's bumped up against, right? The tree branches and your hydrangea oh. branches and it causes mold. And yeah, so, you know, pull it back. Go, you know, everything in moderation, you know, do a little composting, do a little bit of like the mulching and then water it all in. And now you're keeping the moisture in place, you know, you're feeding your soil. So that's a really good, I mean, no matter, I think that's like a really great plan for spring, unless your soil does need the fertilizers. And you know what, then you might have to go out there and give it a shot. Um, but not too much, you know, and don't do it every month. Yeah, for sure. So, well, and to your point about the... Um, the, the mountains, you know, that was a huge thing here in Kansas City. These guys would come around in the spring and they would pile the mulch. Well, on all of these trees now that they've been doing that, what has happened is it's caused insects and boring. And, you know, it sends wow. out the, when, when all that's on the base of the trunk of a tree, it starts to decay and it starts to cause issues with the trunk, right? At the base of where the soil is. The tree then sends out a stress signal. When it sends mm. out that stress hormone, that's when the borers say, Yay, new, <laughs> new wood to go eat. They start boring through. And then what happens wow. is the roots are completely suffocated. And so then that's when you see the little shoots coming out out of the side of the oh, volcano because the tree goes through such stress. Then wow. it starts sending out you know, suckers everywhere to try and keep itself alive. You essentially yeah, suffocate a tree when that happens. So that has been one of my biggest, like I try to always tell landscapers, the guys mm -hmm. that I meet, you know, like around where they're doing landscaping out that it, yeah. it's fine if you pile, but pile like a donut, leave that center section right. open, nothing should that, ever yeah. touch. And same with the hydrangea, same with everything else, you know, we're mulching and we're trying to keep this nice environment where you're able to retain the moisture underneath the soil. And all of that is great. But when you come up against these trees, I mean, it's moisture on wood, you know what I mean? Right. So right. it's None sitting there like that. And it, Fungus it causes type. a host of problems. And it's just hilarious because everyone's not hilarious, but I go to my high V and they have a whole row of trees, beautiful trees that when I first moved here, they had just planted them. And okay. now all these years, 12, 13 years later, these trees probably have a trunk on them about like, you know, like this. Right. And there's everything coming out all over the sides and, oh. and like a mound, a mound you know, yeah. around no, it. No, no mulch mountains, right? <laughs> no mulch mountains. So, to, and also to your point about the worm tea. So yeah. You know, that has been my big mission. And that is why I love working with Petra Tools. I'm not doing this um, for any other reason, but for, I love their products. They have been a huge support to me while I transitioned because I really didn't want to believe that the, the synthetics were that bad. Um, but they have really worked with me to understand all of the different everything that's going on. So one of the things that you mentioned about adding the compost, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, we're going to offer you, I'm going to show you three different products today for being a guest. Oh. And you're going to tell me which one you want from our dear Thank friends you. at Petra tools. But first is worm tea. You guys know, mm -hmm. I love this stuff. I mean, it's amazing. I have seen a tremendous change in my house plants. I feed it to my house plants specifically because they're not outside to get the worm castings oh, and to get all right. of the benefits of the worms. So when I give this stuff to them, I know for certain, and I can tell it makes a difference. I have gorgeous house plants. Yeah, you, really you know do. what I mean? They're fabulous. And I've been using this stuff about two years now. So this is also great, Kelly, as you were saying, if you've got a compost pile outside and you're trying to get things going to get it ready for yeah, spring, yeah. you can actually mix this. And uh, one of these makes like 700 gallons, by the way. Wow. So it's a great, oh, uh, it's a great drink. Yeah, I see. But you can mix it specifically for your compost pile and put this on your compost pile to help it continue to break down quickly so that love when it. you go to apply, you know, it's ready and it's broken it's down. So there's the worm tea. Oh, I love the worm tea. 
Next up is fish and seaweed Ooh, fertilizer, I do which fish, I know I you have a uh, good experience with this. And I want you yes. to talk about it for just a minute. We're so out of time. We're like 10 minutes over. Anyways, I know. We said um, we were going to be really short tonight. <laughs> really <laughs> There's really so much bad. to talk about with plants. Yeah, right. Um, okay. So fish and seaweed fertilizer. Um, this actually, contrary to a popular belief, this doesn't, it smells when you mix it, okay. but then once it goes down into the soil, there is no smell. Um, and then this is just full of a lot of good stuff, a lot of Great vitamins, stuff. nutrients. This is made from uh, hydrolyzed American fish and um, American seaweed. So this is really good stuff right here local to us. And one gallon, this is two tablespoons for outdoor plants to one gallon and one tablespoon for indoor plants. So this is going to last you a really long time too. Yep. Okay. And did you have anything extra you wanted to add about fish and seaweed? applying this to plants. You know, we used to have a whole bunch of um, like yews out front, you know, a whole bunch of other like green shrub. They were just, I don't know, either the deer were eating them or whatever. And we had, you know, like a arborist or someone come out from like the local saber tree. And this is what they applied. They applied some sort of like, you know, fish emollient and, and that whole thing. And, and it perked them right up. I have to say it was amazing. Really? So that's, that's great. Well, I yeah, didn't even think to use it on the big evergreens, but maybe I oh, will do yeah. that next. Well, it was like mostly the small, like the small, well, they were smaller, but of course they would get bigger, sure. but it, it was great. Yeah. Perk them right up. And last but not least, one of my oh. very favorites for OCD, people with OCD <laughs> love this stuff. Um, this is the grass paint. So I use this in the summers to cover over the dog markings. Um, I use it. My whole front yard is green right now. It looks fabulous. It looks like it's a day Terrific. in fall um, or early spring. So uh, what's it going to be, Kelly? What do you think? I uh, am in between the worm tea and the, I'm going to go with the worm tea because I worm love tea. that. I love that whole composting idea for the beginning of spring. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, you're welcome. And one of the yeah, other big benefits to the worm tea that I noticed, I was kind of just playing around because when I was doing my research, you know, before I, before I promote these things, I think people need you to know I spend that. hours, days, months researching this stuff. I'm not going to promote something unless right. I know that it's, you know, worth, worthy of the promotion. So, um, in doing my research, you know, I read that worm tea can actually help with, um, powdery mildew. And so oh, I had areas of my roses that yep. were getting the same mildew every single year. So when it started, this was two years ago. So not this past season, but the year before, um, I sprayed it with the worm tea and it stopped it completely. Stop it. And so, so wait a minute, this, you sprayed the whole plant? Or yes, just I did a foliar spray. A foliar wow. spray because the microbes and the microorganisms that are inside of the worm tea actually right. digest the powdery mildew. Oh, so when it's mixed, now the other thing too, you want to make sure when you're using the worm tea, it's best to be used within six months. Okay. So you want to make sure that you're using it, you know, when right, you first get it. There for, that's what yeah. Now is a great time to be buying it, to be able to use it for this next season. Oh, and um, so this it. past year, something super crazy, I started to notice it coming because the year before I had, it was already kind of in full swing. It was kind of all over. So I sprayed it and it stopped it. And I did a little bit of pruning and it was manageable. Um, I still got beautiful blooms. Everything was great. But this past year I spotted it exactly as it was start, like when it was starting right. and I sprayed it, I had no powdery mildew the entire season wow. on my roses wow. for the I first, for my for the first year too. ever. That's yes. Amazing. Right. The so I haven't done the Xenia, but I'm going to do them again this year and I'm going to totally mm -hmm. use this. Yes. I'm going to use it too, because that's like a bear getting rid of that. Once it kicks in, forget it. But if I guess yeah. you can get it early. Oh, I'm yeah, excited to sure. use that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Okay. Well, let's definitely check back in. Um, thank you so much for spending your time with us oh, today. You. And we will be back in another couple of weeks and talking about more of how we are running our yards and yeah. farms and all the good things and giving more tips. Um, Kelly, why don't you go ahead and give a shout out? I know you've got some flower classes going on. Your YouTube yeah. has just hit new markers. And tell us, tell everybody how they can find you on Facebook to be a part of your membership. Group. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll put links below. So um, my YouTube channel is Kelly Lehman. We just hit a hundred thousand subscribers. So I'm really okay. grateful to our flower tribe because these, you know, just the, the flower tribe is uh, tremendous. You can find us over on Facebook on under Kelly Lehman's Flower Tribe Facebook group. And there's literally like, like almost 7,000 gardeners from all over the world, like all these different countries. And, you know, it got started because of a Flower Tribe member that said, you know, I'm, I'm watching your gardening tip videos. And I see like, sometimes I'll get like, I, at one point we had like 10,000 comments. And most of those comments are questions. And I kept saying, I'm so sorry, I can't keep up with all of them. And he said, well, why can't we help each other? And I was like, oh my gosh, that's like, 
brilliant. So I started the Kelly Lehman's, you know, flower tribe Facebook group and people will say like, I have, you know, this problem with my hydrangea. And then four of the people from the flower tribe will answer the question or this worked for me or this didn't work. So it's, it's a, it's a real wonderful, like great group of people over there. And, um, I also made some, um, flower courses. They're online courses. Uh, they're super cheap. I think they're like nine 99, uh, for each one. And it's like how to put in, cause we have a flower farm and I've made every mistake in the book. And I've spent like a fortune trying to figure this stuff out. So I basically walk you through the easiest to grow flowers that, like I said, like, you know, they thrive on neglect. And so it teaches you how to grow perennials. Uh, there's another course for annuals. There's another course on how to arrange your flowers when you're done. And then I have a holiday course. And so you can check that out. That's on my retrieve uh, website too. And then I have a, a Kelly Lehman, uh, uh, podcast. So it's under, I think, Kelly Lehman's Flower Garden, <laughs> which I should really know the name of my podcast, but it'll be like below. That's kind of new. And then we're also on TikTok and, you know, Pinterest and all those too, but all those links will be below, but I hope to see you guys over there. Absolutely. Well, you've been one of my favorite, favorite people that I've met on Instagram a long time ago, and we just totally clicked really from the very visual. beginning. Yeah, and we've, we've always been, been friends. From the start, which is so nice. Yeah. Yeah, for Love sure. It's been you such a pleasure. Idea. So as always, well, thank you very much. Okay. And we will see you all next time. Until then, Bye. make it a great day and enjoy spring if you're listening to this as spring is kicking in. Yeah. Take Thanks, care. Kelly. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks for listening. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.